let's just get right into it. We only have half an hour, so we don't have uh, you know tons of time to try to work through stuff today. So before we do, we did have some some pretty sick scores recently. We had uh, we had Ape Styles and Lex on the final table. We had our mixed game coach crushing it. So things are going well for BBC. So I'm really happy with how uh, how well things are going. All right. So uh, with that, let's get right into this um, small blind versus button single raise pot scenario. We're just going to run through a couple quick slides. It's not going to take very long at all. The reason is just to kind of give you a little bit of a primer in case you've never seen this uh, type of work before. So, so um, yeah. So as far as why small blind versus button matters, um, the the button versus small blind is is a very important scenario. Uh, button versus big blind is one of the ones that gets studied a lot. As a result, people who do study a lot make less mistakes. But when I coach professional players uh, like Lex or it doesn't matter who they are, um, when I coach professional players, the one of the scenarios that where they're, where they're not nearly as strong is small blind versus button. So it's a very important scenario that gets understudied, I think, by basically you know professionals. So late position heads-up confrontations are essentially the most critical to our win rate. If you go into your database and you look for hands played, you know uh, heads-up versus multi-way pots, you'll see that you play more heads-up pots than multi-way pots. As if you play like a, you know above fifty dollars ABI, um, and then if you look at which positions play the most, um, the big blind is by far the most important position. Um, so which positions invest the most money? Uh, big blind is the most important position, uh, followed up by a typically small blind and, and, um, and button. They're usually very close together. Uh, Preflop and post-flop strategies here are often too weak. We already kind of went over that. Uh, this is one of the more understudied scenarios. And as a result, uh, there's a lot of basically opportunity to do better than the metagame and pick up some extra EV. Okay, some important nuances for small blind preflop. I am going to go over this with charts, but I kind of want you to just have this kind of... Um, you know, for some of you, uh, just have like this, this kind of written out for you so you can see it more clearly. And then I'll ramble on about it as we run through some preflop charts. So the most overfolded component of the small blind flat is the suited 8X and KX region, um, uh, what I'm doing uh, coaching. And then after that, the offsuit 10X. A lot of people know if the button opens, they should flat, um, you know, like jack 10 offsuit or queen 10 offsuit, but they, they don't, they're not nearly as consistent about flatting the suited eights um, or the suited king X. Um, you should recognize that at deeper stacks, the range will basically widen, okay? And um, essentially what ends up happening at deeper stacks is suited 7X becomes a, a bigger part of the preflop flatting range for the small blind. And offsuit ace X uh, gets folded. Um, so it's, it's kind of like an in-out relationship there between suited 7X and offsuit 8X. Um, I think a lot of people end up over flatting uh, medium strength pairs, like eights. Um, and we just went over this. And um, yeah, as a general rule, just don't fold suited ASX or pocket pairs. All right. So with that, you can look at that just for a quick second while I pull up a uh, an example of what I'm talking about. Okay. So this is a kind of standard button open. I will briefly cover this, but this is going to be pretty brief because the focus is on small blind today. Offsuit eight X suited five X offsuit um, uh, ASX and um, suited Broadway. Okay. Now small blind. If this is at sixty bigs. I actually, meant to go to fifty here. At fifty bigs. Small blind flat, suited eights, suited sevens. Okay, these will come out as we get shorter. I'm gonna show that. Um, ace seven offsuit uh, as a VPIP, ace five offsuit 10X, okay? And now as we go to shorter stacks, so a 30. Okay, so the su suited seven X block gets destroyed. Suited eight, eight X block stays in. Offsuit eight X, eight, uh, ace X block is more resilient. We're still seeing these offsuit tens here. And as we go to like a hundred, you'll see the offsuit ace X come out. Um, You'll see the offsuit 10x stay in. You'll see the suited 7x drop in. So this there's this relationship where as we get shorter, okay, as we get shorter, we play more offsuit ace x. As we get uh, and we play less suited 7x. As we get deeper, we play less offsuit ace x and we play more suited 7x. Okay, so that's the um, there's a relationship there. You can see this this uh, suited king x component that I think a lot of people fold down to king six suited with king five suited as a mix at 25 bigs. If you go just to 50 big blinds, you'll see king three suited as a play. If you go to 100 big blinds, you'll see suited king X, uh, all of it as a play, okay? So as we get, again, there's a, there's a relationship there. As we get uh, deeper, um, suited king X uh, is more of a VPIP. As we get more shallow, um, suited king X is less of a VPIP, okay? Um, in both scenarios, pairs were played always, okay? So at 100 big blinds, deuces plus, um, and ace two suited plus, and at 30 big blinds, deuces plus, Ace two suited plus, okay? Now, deuces is more of a three bet as we get shorter, but nonetheless, it's being v the entire time. So when, if you're folding pairs here at all, if you're folding suited ace X here at all, it's obviously a fairly significant uh, mistake. 
Uh, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll actually do a quick primer where we, where we just jump into um, some reports here. I normally don't do this in the 30 minute sessions, but I want to be, you know, a little bit, I want to do it today. <clears throat> so we're gonna do it. Um, all right, so we're gonna just switch this over to, uh, to high cards here. So you can see that the small blind, this is at 30 bigs, we'll actually jump back to 50 just because I want to use that as a baseline. Um, at 50 bigs, there's a somewhat noisy donk bet um, off the off the big blind. So you can see that the big blind, sorry, sorry, I misspoke, small blind. Off the small blind here, there's a somewhat noisy donk. By noisy donk, I mean um, there's an 11%, 10.8% uh, overall kind of like macro strategy donk bet. And it kind of permeates through, you know, you can see that there's a little bit of a donk bet on A-side boards, um, on king high boards, queen high boards, jack high boards. Now, it does peak um, on jack and 10 high boards, okay? So that's that's something to pay attention to. But you do have a somewhat noisy donk. You still have donk betting on four high boards. You still have donk betting on five high boards. So it's something to just kind of keep track of, especially if we're trying to play the small line as aggressively as we can. Uh, try to put in, uh, make sure that we're investing enough money. Um, identifying where some of this donk betting is taking place is pretty important, right? So we see a lot of these 10 high paired boards. We see some jack high paired boards as well, right? 10, 10, deuce, 10, 10, three, um, with very heavy uh, leads off the small blind at 50 bigs. Um, we see a jack high boards with pretty heavy leads off the small line as well. So you see some low end monotone, 10, four, deuce, rainbow. Okay, these are still very heavy leads. I mean, we're still above 40%, so we definitely want to go through this. We see monotone boards here being led quite often, okay? Um, but we do have some specific board texture types now, right? We see like, you know, lots of jack high paired, 10 high paired, um, jack high, uh, low, jack low, low, 10 low, low. Um, and then we see monotone textures uh, that are coordinated pre-flop. Um, we see some jack high monotone textures. Um, we're not seeing quite so many at, like, at this kind of a lead frequency where we're still at basically 40% plus. We're still seeing lots of density in like the 10, five, four, 10 low, low. Okay, so um, very quickly, just in terms of notation for you guys. When I say, so, so there's ASI flops, there's high card flops. High card flops will generally be like King, Queen, Jack, 10. There's medium flops, which will generally be like nine, eight, seven, six, maybe, uh, yeah, roughly speaking. And then there's low flops, which would be like uh, five, four, three, deuce, roughly maybe six, five, four, three, deuce, maybe a little bit of overlap there, okay? So when I say high, low, low flops, or, or when I say jack, low, low flops, I mean like jack, four, deuce here. This is like a jack, low, low flop, okay? This is like a, a 10, low, low flop, right? It's a notation that's helpful for clustering boards together so that we can think about them. Um, in a, in a in a more organized way, right? So this is like a a, a ten mid mid flop, or like yeah, that's like basically the way that I would think about this um, when as as I'm thinking about uh, ten high boards. It's also coordinated, okay? So that's something that's also important. Again, we see these somewhat coordinated low monotone board textures. We see ace queen jack here, but the basic idea here is to make sure that you invest enough money on specifically because now we're starting to drop down to much lower lead frequencies. Make sure that you're investing enough money on. Um, 10 high boards, whether they're 10 high paired, 10 high, um, 10 high connected, like that 10, nine, eight, um, 10 low, low, jack low, low, make sure that you're, you're dog fighting enough, make sure that you're putting in enough money. Um, that's one of the critical details about these scenarios. Okay. And then we're just going to sort of skip over, um, the, the button strategy. Um, if we go back though, just so you can see it very quickly. Uh, you can see that we're, we're using, um, small bets fairly often with some medium bets as well. So it's like it's like a pretty even split between bet small and bet large um, across most board textures. Um, some board textures that you might make a uh, mistake on in a button small line confrontation would be like ace, king, deuce. Because I think a lot of people bet range there. That's a pretty big mistake. It's uh, supposed to be like um, uh, check or bet huge. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see there's a lot of mixing here. And a decent amount of small betting. I do think that small betting is utilized by the metagame more than it's supposed to be in this scenario. Um, so we're gonna have to go ahead and look at the small blind versus a small bet because I think it's um, the most common answer even if it is overutilized and less common. It should be less commonly deployed than it actually is. So I just want you guys to get a feel for how much we should be raising here. Um, and you can just kind of aggregate these three numbers here. Uh, to give you an idea of um, you know what you should be doing, and it gives you all like you know just just under I think like a fourteen percent uh, check raise, which is not crazy, but it's not never. You can see that across most board textures, you're using a fairly similar strategy uh, with regards to the check raise. You can see that your fold percentage is also fairly consistent um, against this uh, this one third bet size. Okay, so like there's nothing crazy in terms of like folding all the time, right? So you're going to be defending like somewhat comparable to like a mathematical minimum um, or an MDF. Um, across most board textures, like most flop types, right? There's no one flop type where you fold way more than an MDF. Um, 
for people that are curious what the MDF would be in this situation, it would be 75%, you'd be folding 25, right? Versus a one third bet. It's always gonna work that way. Um, uh, we have plenty of content free and paid that you can consult if you don't know how to do that, but um, I just kind of want to move on a little bit and get into some hands before we, before I spend the whole hour looking at spreadsheets, which is never good for, uh, for students. They only, they can only take so much. Um, all right, and let's jump into the trainer here. I may have to, uh, modify just a couple of things as I do this, but yeah, I want to go back here before the, uh, the check. And let's just make sure that we're doing it this way and we should be good to go. All right, guys, you're up. Um, is anybody going to dog bet this scenario or are you guys going to check? What's the plan? Yeah, I'm going to check here. I don't, I don't dog bet this particular board. So I'll, I'll check. Okay. And we face, um, I don't know, this is like a 60% bet, I guess. I think I thought it was 55 was like the more common sizing in this model, but maybe that's what it is. Um, what do you guys want to do? You are up. What would you like to do versus this bet size? All right. So a lot of you guys, a little bit of folding, a lot of calling. Okay. So how do I think about this? Right. Um, I'm, I may get the answer wrong. We'll see. But the first thing is on low card boards like this that have very little interaction, what you're going to see is you're going to see a, um, a high card oriented defending strategy where the defending strategy is very dense ace high hands and then king high hands and then queen high hands and then jack high hands. So when you're organizing how to play this board, you play high cards first. Okay. The second thing you want to do, um, is you're going to have to recognize that you're going to be folding some backdoor flush draw type hands, but probably not the three to a straight three to a flush ones. So like 10, nine, for example, suited, um, 10, nine of hearts or 10, nine of diamonds, probably, probably quite playable. Um, uh, it is a bigger bet. So you're gonna have to fold more. Um, I don't think this hand's going to fold. So I'd play this hand, but, um, it may mix a little bit to fold, but I would expect this hand to, to for the most part, play. Um, it, again, it is a big bet. So it is somewhat annoying, but um, oh well. So again, is it, it is a big bet. It's somewhat annoying. Oh well. I mean, that's, that's, that's like the, you know, the best I can give you as far as explanations here. Um, as we look at how the defending strategy is constructed, uh, we'd expect to see a pretty, pretty heavy high card orientation. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, ace high first, right? You see a lot of the, these ace highs are quite playable. Then if you look within the king high block, king queen uh, offsuit is playable, but king nine offsuit is not playable. Again, just kind of high card orientation. Um, king jack is a mix with, with no backdoor flush draw. Um, king 10 with a backdoor flush draw is pure play. King nine with a backdoor flush draw is pure play. Okay, um, 10 nine, I mentioned this hand specifically. 10 nine with a backdoor flush draw is pure play. Okay, um, you can see that you know the, the jack 10 of clubs here is actually still a mix, which is pretty gross. Um, queen 10 of clubs here is pure fold, uh, well, getting close to pure fold, right? I would pure fold queen 10 of clubs in this example. Um, I probably would have folded a um, uh, jack 10 as well, to be honest with you, um, uh, if I had clubs. Um, okay, and we can keep going. You guys are up. Where's the one fourth speed button? Go watch an ape style session. <laughs> Go watch an ape style session and you'll get the 25% speed option. He talks much more slowly than I do. Yeah, I'm gonna be checking here. Um, when I'm specifically, when I look to lead the turn, I'm looking for um, something that's essentially uh, dynamic, right? So when I when the when the button bets and I call, essentially I'm acknowledging that I'm in some way behind the buttons range, right? I have a more bluff catching dense range, a more medium strength range. Doesn't mean I can't have any traps, but most of my range when I just check call the flop is a medium strength bluff catching range, and this player's range is constructed in a way that's at least slightly more polarized, where um, they have those the very strongest hands. Maybe I have less of the very strongest hands, and they have um, air. Right, that's the way betting ranges typically work, um, and so they have a more polar range. I have a more condensed medium strength range. I'm calling down. They are betting, right? And it, this relationship will hold. Okay, so this 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 um, this range construction will hold under the vast majority of scenarios. It will break down on turns where that just changes, right? Where um, I end up pulling out front in terms of my range, right? Where I come out way ahead, um, and I have now the top. And this player is now more of the middle. If the turn re uh, if the turn shifts the way these two ranges look uh, when they compare to one another, then I'll start leading. 
if I if they don't do that, for the most part, I won't stop bleeding. There are going to be some rare exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's going to be how it works. I don't really perceive this turn to be that be like that. Um, this would be more meaningful, for example, if I was maybe in the big blind, where I would be check calling uh, maybe slightly more hands around the seven. But in this scenario, um, I don't think the small blind's got a range that interacts with the seven at all. So I would just continue to check. You guys are up. What do you guys want to do? I think this one's a little bit easier, right? I think we're going to fold. But um, I just want to show you the uh, the turn really quickly from the perspective of the small blind here. We don't lead anything. And I just want to, okay, go over here. So we see that there's some leading on an eight. I think that's a fairly interesting card. But I think that what's somewhat counterintuitive about the eight here is that when the eight pairs, I think what ends up happening is ace high becomes a very significant um, and important contributor to um, the equity on the turn because the board's eight, eight, eight deuce, right? So that means that the, the ace high is like the most important. It will becomes extremely important, extremely relevant. I think that, that what that ends up doing is it ends up um, being quite good for the small blind flat because, or at least I think it can end up being quite good for the small blind flat because the, uh, let me take a look at this here. Because the small blind's so dense high cards, right? Small blind's so dense high cards, so, so much ace high. And on a relative basis here, I think the equities are still gonna run pretty close together here. Um, yeah, so the, the button still has the strongest hands here, but the small blind can lead to a very small size, probably for the most part, because of all the density around this like 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80% equity category. So this is always gonna be a small lead. I mean, like this, this is pretty interesting. Like this this like uh, this mid-size lead here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use this at all, to be honest with you. Um, but I guess it's coming from this part of the region here. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting to see the, the, the heavy lead on the eight there. And we fold here, right? And it's not super interesting. It's pretty easy. Okay, guys, you're up. What do you want to do? Yeah, I'm going to check. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something, but I'm checking for sure. So this is a very small amount, but I'm, I'm checking. All right, you guys are up again. I'm probably going to call. I think if I do want to raise, probably not going to raise this way. I think there are maybe slightly better ways. First of all, if I wanted to use just like low, low, the lowest ace x, I'd use a seven first. Um, if I didn't want to use a six, for example, with a gut shot. Um, and yeah, so I, I like this hand may have a, like a modest raise percentage, um, but I'm gonna mostly just call here. Uh, ooh, I didn't really touch on folding. I don't think I, I don't know if I would have folded there. I mean, like it's, it's gonna be this bet size that's the, the kind of the ingredient that's driving this hand towards zero, <clears throat> as well as how far down this ace x component is, but. Yeah, so ace eight, ace eight folds the most. Um, yeah, they're all mixes against this bet size. If we go to the smaller bet size, I kind of overlooked the bet size, to be honest with you. If we go to the smaller bet size, I'm used to this, this smaller bet size, just like when I'm playing a lot. The smaller bet size, these are all pure plays, okay? And then versus the 55% size, we're starting to see some indifference uh, from some of this ace block, which makes sense. I'm just not saying it's, it's illogical or anything. It's, it's, <laughs> obviously, it's logical, it's a solver. Um, but yeah, like I, 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 if I thought about it more, I think I could have gotten this. Um, and yeah, I mean, like the, the two bets a little bit noisy by suit. So if you if you just look at this, it's a little bit noisy by suit here. I mean, surely we see um, like we see like this uh, the seven of spades bias here, not the ace of spades bias, but we see a seven of spades bias with a seven at least. But we still see quite a meaningful amount of check raise without the without the spade. Um, ace eight, there's no check raise. Um, ace nine, there's a little bit with the nine of spades here. Uh, I'm sorry, rather, rather with the ace of spades. I apologize. Ace of spades here. Um, but we're still seeing a little bit of noise um, from some of these one-heart combos, it looks like. Ten of spades here. Oh my god, I can't speak. Ace of spades here. Ten of spades over here. All right. Um, but yeah, this hand was indifferent on the flop. I don't think this is going to change anything. We're going to check. And you guys are up. What do you want to do? Yeah, I think we just fold now, right? Pretty easy. So um, as far as heuristics go, to that I think a lot of people um, that can be very helpful for thinking about Nullimit Hold'em. I'm not gonna find it, but we do have a graphic that, that might be helpful. But it's helpful to just think about your range like a pyramid, right? It's helpful to just think about your range like a pyramid. And essentially like when, uh, as you move, as you face bets, you go higher and higher and higher up the period, uh, pyramid. And as you go higher and higher and higher up the pyramid, the range gets more and more narrow, okay? So we're facing a bet, the range is going to get more narrow. The reason that's a helpful heuristic is because we found, found out that this hand was worth zero on the flop, right? It was mixing to fold. So this hand was indifferent, worth zero on the flop. So this hand, this card did not improve this hand. And as we move kind of up the pyramid of our range, facing another bet, um, it becomes pretty trivial to be like, okay, what hand was pretty close on the flop 
oftentimes if those hands don't improve, they become pure folds on the turn, right? For facing further aggression. So um, not all the time, but fairly uh, fairly common. Right? It's, a, it's a helpful heuristic for um, moving through, moving through your range. Okay, Ace four four rainbow. This is not going to be one of the boards that I'm going to be leading. So we're going to check again. Okay, guys, you're up. What do you want to do? Okay, so this is tough uh, to be honest with you. Um, this is always this this is usually the type of uh, like the equity profile that's going to be quite challenging. Um, it's a smaller bet. So uh, we saw that across basically all flops, we're going to be using um, around, uh, like across all high card flops at least, we're using around um, an MDF fold, which would be here on 25%, so it could be higher than that, um, but uh, not not meaningfully higher. So now this board texture, I think is actually quite bad for, for VPIP from the small blind. So I expect it to be maybe a little bit even more elevated than that. So maybe like um, 32, 35, something like that, 34, maybe. Um, so I'm folding like a third of my range, which is pretty meaningful. Um, the first hands I'm going to play here, obviously, are pairs. Uh, well, ace-x, I guess. Ace-x, then pairs, then king-high, then queen-high, right? So ja having jack-high kind of sucks. Having a backdoor flush draw, like if I had jack-10 of clubs, obviously, it's a pretty trivial fold, right? Um, having the backdoor flush draw makes it harder. This hand may may end up being a fold here. It may not end up being a fold here. I think this is this is, um, this is this is a tough spot for me. I may mix this hand if I was playing this spot because it's a pain in the ass. I expect to hand like 10-8 of hearts to pure fold. I expect to hand like 10-9 of hearts to pure fold. So... 10-9 of hearts is, yeah, I mean, like, I expect that hand of pure fold. This one does have a backdoor straight draw, so it's harder. Uh, some people mentioned um, two-betting here. I think that's reasonable. This probably duplicates the uh, top of my flatting range as well. Like, I don't necessarily think I'm flatting ace-jack much, but I think I have uh, quite a bit of, like, ace-ten. So maybe, like, 10-9 is a good hand to two-bet. But I don't think jack is a bad hand to two-bet. So I think this is, like, a reasonable option. Um, I think this is a reasonable option. I think this is a reasonable option. So this sucks. Um... Okay, so it turns out we can't fold. Two bets quite good. And let's go ahead and take a look at some of the hands that around this hand that I thought would be folded like 10-8 with a, with a backdoor flush draw. Okay, so there's 10-8 with a backdoor flush draw, mostly, you know, a very heavily folded. Um, there's 10-9 with a backdoor flush draw, very heavily folded, right? 72% for 10-9 of spades there. So it's, I mean, it's mixed to fold. It's not like it's pure fold or anything. But that kind of speaks to why I thought this situation was difficult, right? Like I knew going in, that 10-8 was going to be a fold, right? I, I was fairly confident that 10-9 was going to be a pretty, pretty heavily folded combo as well. And that means that Jack-10 is like kind of a pain in the ass. So Jack-10 uh, also has the um, backdoor straight draw component. Um, it's also higher up, uh, which makes it a stronger VPIP. Um, uh, you can see Jack-10 of clubs there still mixing, which is pretty sick. Um, Queen-9 here uh, with the backdoor flush draw. So, you, you know, Jack-10 is obviously very, very close, has a close relationship with like 10-9, Queen nine, right? Like it's it's right around there, and these hands are all mixed to fold. And I expected those hands to mix to fold, right? Now, in contrast, you can see again on a, on a board like this, um, one of the heuristics I use for organizing this information is, uh, and the, one of the things I said was that we're going to use still like kind of a high card defending strategy. I said we're going to play our king high hands first. So you can see like king nine offsuit, okay? King nine offsuit is better than ten nine suited, right? Like king nine offsuit is very close to pure play, whereas ten nine with the backdoor flush draw is not, right? So you do want, like by studying, you can start to get used to these relationships, understanding how they work. They're pretty reliable. Um, and then you can use those to be more predictive with in terms of uh, producing a good strategy, right? Um, all right, we keep going. You guys are up, what do you guys wanna do? Okay, so one of the things this turn does is it nullifies um, the kicker advantage that the button had, right? So the button had an advantage in terms of like, you know, neither player interacted with this four very well. And then the button had um, asymmetries in the uh, opening range around ace-king, right? Ace-king, ace-queen, right? I'm not, you're not flatting ace-king from the small blind with 50 bigs, right? You're going to three-bet that pure. So this turn kills that advantage, right? So this turn can be quite helpful uh, in that regard. So you may see some leading here. Um, I think the, the high-frequency play is going to be to check. But because the um, this, this range is very dense, kind of like medium strength hands, but a lot of those medium strength hands on the flop are like ace six, ace five, ace seven, right? Ace eight, uh, ace nine, right? Um, and those hands were losing to some of the stronger hands in the button's opening range, like ace king and ace queen, and that they no longer lose. So this is a very important turn. Uh, we may end up seeing lead, leading as a result of that. It wouldn't surprise me at all, um, but I don't know if I'm gonna lead here, and as a result, I'd probably check. Um, yeah, so there's, there's some at least some lead coming in here. Yeah, it's a pretty meaningful lead. I would've fucked this up. Um, I would've been suspicious about whether or not I should lead, but I wouldn't have done it anything close to this magnitude. And yeah, so you can see this 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 ace. And I, I mean, I already went over all the reasons why I thought this was like a pretty good idea. Um, I just said I wouldn't do it because I, I wasn't sure. Um, sometimes I'm a nit. Actually, I'm usually a nit. I like to, I study a lot. So if I don't know, I usually just wuss out and check. Um, 
if I studied less, I might have to gamble more. But uh, I study enough that I usually don't don't gamble. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this is a good, this is a pretty good high frequency lead card here, and then um, uh, the four here. Uh, also a pretty good high frequency lead card but you see that, that both of these two cards they actually accomplish the same thing right so when the four comes in um when the four comes in it kills the pre-flop range advantage around ace king and ace queen because an ace is a boat if a four comes in right when an ace comes in it kills the pre-flop range advantage around ace king and ace queen um because an ace is a boat right so um both of these two cards actually like we can use the same explanation same thesis uh to kind of understand both of these two phenomena here um and what percentage of our aces are three betting pre? Um, I don't know the percentage of ace x that three bets pre, but I can show you the range. Um, so we have like this entire suited ace x block over here, and then we have um, like some density. I don't know what 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 percentage this is though. Um, but then we have like ace jack three ace seven offsuit here. Um, okay, and uh, let's go back to the solution here. So donk betting was a would have been a pretty clever play here. All right, guys, you're up. What do you guys want to do? It's a little bit of a weird spot. It's a little bit of a weird spot. All right. So I think it's going to be a little bit difficult to jam because of, primarily because of the um, the SPR. So I think if we had like two to one SPR, I think jamming becomes like quite reasonable. It's possible that jamming is still quite reasonable. Um, you, you do typically see a lot of like fairly large betting in these scenarios, but I think it's, it's and it's usually shove. But we have a four to one SPR, and we also have um, an ace is, is the most covered uh, card in an opening range, right? So um, the button opens the ace to offsuit, but does not open king to offsuit, right? So um, the button has so much ace x um, going into the turn. Obviously, they would barrel quite a bit of it, but they're not going to barrel all of it. So they have too much board coverage, I think, to jam. I'm, I'm not a jam. Fan. I'm not a big fan of jam. Um, yeah, I think the SPR is too deep in the, the fraction of the buttons opening, the fraction of the buttons uh, range that includes um, ace is still too high. So I don't like jam too much. Um, I think, I think like pot over bet are probably pretty good. I think blocking is like not bad, um, but probably not, not great. I think you'd rather bet seven when you have like pocket fives minimum. So yeah, I mean like, I kind of like this answer, uh, the 16 and a half. I kind of like this answer. I kind of like this answer. I don't really like checking much. Um, and I don't really like these other answers here, but this is a little bit more tricky because, again because of the SPR. If we were, if we had like, if we had like 20 left in our stack, I'd just tell you to jam. Uh, if we had like 18 in our stack, I'd tell you to jam, but, um, we don't. So I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is going to be. I think we give up. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, it's not impossible, but I think that you usually see these betting ranges like this, these scenarios get bet pretty aggressively. They don't bet range. So, I mean, like there's going to be some give ups, but, and like, you know, this isn't a great hand or anything. Um, but, uh, like we're playing the board. But I think that you're going to see them like a decent fraction of these bets still. Especially if you miss the turn lead, then you're going to have to bet this for sure. It's still jammed. So I picked the biggest bet that wasn't a jam. Um, it does pure jam. And yeah, I mean, I, I already expressed my concerns about jamming. I th jamming would be my default if I had 2x, uh, 2x SPR. As I, I said that too. Um, so I missed it at a 4x SPR. And I'm okay with that. So, so you can see the jam and bet 91% of the two competitive answers. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if jam would be viable, so I went with uh, basically with the overbet option. So I just moved this range over here. Um, but you can see that you're not, we're not really betting small, um, which is good because that's kind of where I was at in terms of uh, my thinking. I didn't really want to bet small. I mentioned, I also mentioned that like even a hand like pocket fives doesn't want to block, right? I specifically said pocket fives might want to bet like seven or something, but it doesn't want to bet block. Now it doesn't want to bet seven. Uh, pocket fives actually can bet 91%. Um, but um, yeah, I'm pretty like, I'm semi comfortable with, with the way that this looks. Um, you do have to check fold some hands, um, like it's not just pure, it's, uh, or at least you have to check some hands, I don't know if that's gonna, what, what it's going to do necessarily, but you are checking, um, uh, you are checking some hands for sure, and there's not just, it's not just like pure bet the entire range, um, it is split between like, you know, a large sizing and a jam, um, and again, I was just a little bit uncomfortable with, uh, with the jamming option, um, yeah, so, um, there's, so like this is if this is, put it this way this is not one of the situations a lot, a lot of situations where you're playing the board end up being like oh if I jam like the other guy has to call it this whole range like this is not one of those uh, there's too much ASX in both players ranges um, so the button's got a five percent five percent ASX uh, ratio here going into the um, going into the river 
I don't think it's unreasonable for me to think that um, maybe we should uh, evaluate other sizings, although um, Jeremy ends up being quite good. All right. Um, so hopefully this was uh, helpful for you guys and you got some value out of it um, and enjoyed it. Uh, we are running straight into the 7 a.m. session, the BBC seminar that's running already. So um, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up here. But yeah, uh, again, hopefully this was interesting. You guys got some value out of it. Really appreciate all of you. Um, seminars are running in full swing. We've got tons of new coaches in there. Uh, we've got more sessions. We've, we've added sit and go sessions recently. So there's, there are more seminars going. Um, we've got uh, kind of a diverse lineup of coaches. A lot of the, all of the best coaches I can find in the Limit Hold'em tournaments are the guys that I'm using. Um, people that I personally want to hear from. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the, the, the standard lineup as well, me, Ape Styles, uh, Yargo, um, you know, the usual, the usual. So thanks very much guys. Really appreciate all of you. And Jordan, just really yeah. quickly, just reminding the, the people that we have all the charts, the free, uh, the, oh, yeah, the complete Friday. chart package is, uh, for, for free today. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So you guys, yeah, today's uh free chart Friday, essentially for the, for, for the day, but we're going to be running this for the, for the next little while as well. So you guys can go to the, um, uh, BBC website and go mess around with the, the charts because they are, they don't cost you anything today. All right, guys. And, um, yeah, thank you, Mac. And, uh, thanks to the rest of you who showed up. Appreciate all of you. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.